we as children always uh, treated airplanes like taxis. You know, there were unique items. So we stood out in the street and clapped. And when the plane we heard the roar, we started clapping, knowing that it was going to grow, drop um, bombs. There were probably small bombs that created, you know, uh, little holes in the area where they were dropped, killing one woman. The following year, when tranquility came again, there was another player. We were out in the street again clapping, but this time a rain came from the plane in the form of little chocolates, the size of a chocolate bars, two inches by one inch. This company of Pavlidis, the equivalent of um, uh, Hershey in Greece, thought of this advertising. So here we were expecting to work, and down came candy bars, chocolate bars. Very nice experience. <coughs> this was always all these <laughs> attacks harbingers of what was coming when Italy invaded Greece. Um, <clears throat> during this year, uh, as I said, we had in 1936 a new government, uh, a, a dictatorship that uh, was led by Metaxas, John Metaxas, the, the general who dissolved Parliament, brought back again King George, and said, among other things, high school has to start after grade four of grade school. So here I was in 1937, <laughs> finishing my fourth year, and uh, I had to start high school. And uh, so we were given the list of books, Latin, ancient Greek, modern Greek, uh, grammar, which we never saw before. Um, and uh, we had classes of art, uh, sculpture, all kinds of things. <coughs> this uh, decade was characterized in 1932 by the arrival of Uncle John, my father's brother, from the States to Greece. He had just finished medical school in Cincinnati and became a specialist in eye, ear, nose, and throat. In those days, those specialists were one uh, under one ear. And um, we were having a little picnic by the Aegean Sea. There's my mother and her sister. And there's me. There's my brother, two years younger. And there's Anula her daughter, my cousin, and these two kids are children of this lady whose name I can remember her name. So it was during this event that a young lady came running and said, Uncle John from America is here. So we knew where he was going to stay with my grandparents, his parents. So we started collecting everything going back, and I was given charge of this plate uh, pot to carry it back. But this was carrying water. And as the adults were running or rushing, we were trying to run behind them. And the weight of this became unbearable, so it slipped away and broke into pieces. They forgot to tell me to empty the water. So <laughs> that's what it happened. But immediately I started to cry, because I knew that if I cried, I wouldn't get beaten up. So it worked totally. Uh, they all ignored me and the, and the clay pot, and we all went to see Uncle John. Now, for those who read the book, they know what Uncle John did. He took a picture, a film, a four-minute film of the whole family. <coughs> and one of the many things that happened during this year of relative tranquility was to visit with my uncle, uh, Triandopoulos, this fellow here, he's dapper. The reason he looks so handsome is because he was a painter and he's brought it to him. And um, uh, he had enough, he was aficionado of soccer. We call it 
food going to each one. And um, every Saturday, there would be a mass to his town, which was going to be in our town. And he would come and stay with us. So one day he says, my mother, we'll take Nick to come with me. He says, why did you do that? Oh, don't worry. Yes, but you can buy tickets because these were special event tickets that you bought in your town, like this town, came to us and it was one day in the evening they left. Well, my mother said, okay, take this. So here I am now, this is the following day. <coughs> but what happened the night of the trip to Kentucky was I was ushered into a very crowded train uh, uh, car. The light in the compartment was barely you know, 40 watts, who knows. So the conductor came, and the moment he said, tickets please, they shot me under the, <laughs> under the seat. So he didn't see me or hear me or anything. So I got my trip to come to me free. And that is the memoir in the part of the city called Uh This is now in 1930. 37, when I'm first year high school, and we were asked to wear special caps with an owl at the top and a special number that was identifying us, 217. Sort of lucky, because I was born on January 17, not February 17, but that's close enough. And it's Chris, my brother, who you hear about, my mother, and my father. My father, a few years back, a uh, handlebar and stuff, a mustache that my mother wanted to get rid of, and she wouldn't. So, to satisfy her, he kept tweaking small amounts, and here is the uh, very tiny amount. Um, so now, uh, suddenly this tranquility is broken, the Italians invade Greece. Um, and um, uh, a few weeks after the initiation of facilities, uh, the Italian plane sponsors are leaving. My brother and I, uh, I forgot to tell you that at the end of the first year of high school, my grandparents, who left Alice and and went to the Saloniki, said to my parents, send Nick over which means send him to the Saloniki. We'll send him to the best high school. Which wasn't, which was very true. It was a very uh, top-notch high school. It was the annex of the University of Salonika. <coughs> they had only 30 students per, per class, and each one had to take an entrance exam. And if you did maintain a certain average, which in those days 20 was the highest number, and 14 was the lowest. If you had anything below 14, <coughs> they sent you to a regular high school. So. I went there, I went to the Salonese, and a tremendous uh, eyes opener because the Salonese was 260,000 versus Alexandropolis that was only 12,000. So here I see streetcars, bus lines, uh, millions of people walking up and down, uh, very uh, inescapable uh, and uh, an experience that was really uh, eye-opening for me. So when we had, uh, when the planes began to bomb the Saloni, we, if we really were in the big, in the center of the city, we tried to go in the basement of the big building because they were built very solid with a lot of cement and it was this way protected. So one time we were, my brother and I working away from my uncle Elias uh, office, who was a lawyer, and my brother, my, uh, my father. And we got into this building, but before we got into the building, we saw a soldier on his motorcycle, uh, a messenger. He had a little leather back, and he tried to outrun the plane, because suddenly, when he heard the sirens, he sped. I mean, who knows? So, at the end of the uh, A-ray, we went out and started walking towards home. About two blocks up, 
we see a motorcycle on the, on the, on the street and a body of a soldier on the sidewalk. Dead. So that's why he tried to ask around the opera bombs in the mouth. Well, when he went to, uh, to escape and avoid all these constant bombings, we left the city, we went to a village, and we stayed there until June of the next year, 1941, after the German invasion. <coughs> the first victims that we recognized uh, from our family uh, of, <coughs> of an Italian front was Uncle Afanasio, my father's cousin, who came home with uh, missing <coughs> so he was working uh, support. It gives you an idea where the Saloniki is with respect to Greece is Athens. And here, this part is the European part of Turkey. This is Asia Minor. And this little dot here is where my paternal, maternal family came to Greece from after the 1922 agreement between the two countries. And in this place was the paternal uh, family from this part of Turkey. In 1922, they migrated in the same place about San Luis, that situated somewhere there. It's a coastal. And uh, you can get, these are all uh, kilometers. Athens to Thessaloniki, about 500 kilometers. And uh, Athens to Istanbul, Istanbul is, we like to call it, was 800. This is a picture of, uh, I would say, modern day Saloniki, but this building and this church were victims of bombings. Uh, the uh, bell tree was damaged and the whole top of it was destroyed, but when you rebuilt, minus the height that was originally there. Um, I won't take any more time to this. Uh, this is the Arts of Galerius, a very uh, uh, important monument to the Saloniki from the times of the Romans. Uh, and my house then was about, about a block away this way. This is now all changed, and you see all, all you see is high rises. The streetcars used to go up in the arch. And here's another relic of the Roman period. This was called the Rotunda. It was built by them, and it was, I don't know whether it was a, a temple of some kind, <coughs> but in 1452, the Turks took, uh, occupied that part of Greece, and they built a minaret. Before that, though, the Christians had added a portion. So it was first a Roman forum, and then a Christian church, and then an Ottoman monastery. Um, what do you call it? Mosque. Minaret. Yeah. yeah. And um, Mohammedan uh, place of worship. Uh, this is now a more modern view. You can see the difference. Uh, here's the same uh, the Tanda, the Arts of Galerius. And all you see is this high rises made of pure cement. But the house that we live still survives because it has the old tiles right there. That was our house. That was also demolished and replaced by something. And, and on April 6, 41, the uh, uh, German forces invaded Greece. And uh, my father's brother, Safoki, died in the last day of the crew. Very sad day in the family. His mother, my grandmother, and my aunt, his wife, were inconsolable. They tried to talk to every soldier who came about and to the village where we were staying in those days, asking if they saw at least to believe in some of the odd. Yeah, we saw him here. The point is that he was in probably saw who knows when we expect the time he was killed. But even when we went to see a medium to see whether we could connect the mm -hmm. soul. Uh, I remember everybody holding hands. Nothing moved, nothing happened. So we gave up. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and here's a picture of uh, 
the German uh, soldiers arriving in the colony. And for those who don't know what Calderini is, in, uh, which is the Greek word for cobblestone, there it is. So, that goes from the coast. Um, you all probably remember, I told you, maybe I didn't, but in the book I do explain what echoes of the Coliseum. This is my comparison of the cleats uh, making uh, echoes as I walked on this Coliseum with uh, an incomparable way from the echoes made by the German uh, boots who also had cleats at the bottom of their sole. Now this is the worst part of the occupation. Uh, what characterized this period was that the food supplies disappeared. There was starvation all over, especially in the larger cities. And uh, as you walked around, you would see queues of children and adults receiving a bowl of soup, a cup of sugar, a bowl of rice. Uh, the worst part was that the German uh, command removed many food supplies from uh, whatever they were uh, have, uh, happened to be and send them to Germany because their people also were <coughs> at very difficult straits during that time. Uh, so the, what was the result of this uh, very serious period of depravity uh, was deprivation of the was death from the relation whether it was at home or in the street. And in all this, my family thought that I should be doing something besides being stupid, stay out of trouble. I should get busy and do little things like selling bread, <coughs> candy and cigarettes, or peanuts, or go with a little Jewish guy who I didn't know that my uncle knew they both were part of the underground, and they knew when a German train would come after the Salonese, and they would rest until they went south. So he says, you go down there with this fellow, and you're going to sell him little handkerchiefs, souvenirs, silk, silk handkerchiefs, usually green, yellow, white. They have stamps of a souvenirs of places in Greece, and at the bottom it says, in German, for your mother, for my mother, for my father, my my daughter, my father, my mother. So I, uh, as I was walking around, those German soldiers resting their uh, weary feet, I just began to read. I said, for my mother, for my father. And then some of them started to laugh. And then all the German guys tell me, no. You're supposed to read Dynamo. Dynamo or Yurma in German. So I learned a little German. And, <laughs> and I probably sold one or two of them. But that was one, another failed ex uh, enterprise. My <coughs> enterprise, as I said, was selling bread because that is very, um, it has two stories to it. Will come. I have a picture of me selling bread in a little basket. And the, the, the way we do it, we go in the morning in a little place where workers would go by about 6 o'clock in the morning. And um, they would stop and buy small rolls like the ones they serve today with your <laughs> cheese steak. And uh, they would go on to work. But they would um, already be eating their bread because a few blocks before me there were other sellers. So by noon I hadn't sold very much. So I went to the tavern because the taverns would feed you or give you food but no bread. And bread was a staple in any, you know, uh, Greek menu. But there was no bread so they would buy buy from us. This shows you the um, avenue by the sea, here's uh, the Aegean on this side, you can see it. There's a tower of Thessaloniki, which was built by the Turks many years ago, and it was used as a prison. And here's the soldiers, and you see this uh, used to be a coffee house, 
and now it's a soldier's uh, uh, house, home. But I show you this specifically to show you the uh, typical life as it, it involved very young kids and very old people. This young guy is a shoeshine boy. And he's another shoeshine boy who you don't see in his uh, case on. And he's an old man with a rug that's folded. So he's either just bought it or brought it there to sell it so that he can buy this some bread from four wheel cars to two wheel boxes. And here's a group of uh, three Italian soldiers uh, going to their one of the headquarters and this young man using this little <coughs> uh, carriage with their luggage. This was very common. You would see stands about 10 of them in a row, just like taxis that would be there. And people would get off the bus and get off the train. Again, uh, electric uh, streetcars, trunks as we call them. And they were really loaded each time. But electricity, again, was regulated by the German forces. So in the middle of the day, they'll probably cut off the electricity and the street cars would just stay there standing for two, three hours before they resume the, 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 uh, their trip. So, uh, so our lives were really, uh, most of the time, determined by what the occupation forces wanted to do. And one of the new ways of moving cars was this uh, system of gazozin in French, meaning the uh, generation of oxygen or, or gas. So in this system, you just uh, burn charcoal and the gas generated would be compressed and it would give rise to the uh, mm -hmm. move, move the, uh, the engine of a car or of a bus in this case it's a bus mm -hmm. 1940 don't think that these were innovation, innovations in the states in 1980 and 1990 there were <coughs> the anyway, here's a, a picture of kids and adults way to be served soup. This is in Athens, 1941. Um, in Thessaloniki, we did the same thing. We were notified the day before through the papers that there would be soup, or there would be rice, and then we'd go and wait, and we would be given a small portion. And here is now another scene. Kids in this, with shoes, of that shoes and adults scavenging through <coughs> the garbage camp. I don't think they would find much. <coughs> the other thing which was very dramatic and very sad was to see a woman with her children uh, just sitting in the sidewalk there or in front of a church, in the door of a church, and during the winter of 1942, which would have one of the coldest times, many of these hungry people would die. Mm. So I had experienced people walking in front of me on the sidewalk, and suddenly this fellow would just reel back and forth and fall down mm. dead. The, the other sad thing was that this picture, the next day or two days later, would be mine as a child or mine and some other. And <coughs> illnesses. This is a sign, those who can read, read, you see that it says here, typhus, typhus. It was typhus, this is in Athens. And the sign said, attention, uh, typhus, the entrance is forbidden. Uh, TB was very common. I became TB positive, but I've never had clinical TB. Uh, and of course, the next day, uh, city buses, trucks would go and collect the dead bodies from the streets. 
Greece lost a million people during the war. 10% of their population, which is a lot. And here is a funeral. Very, very simple, unassuming. And uh, you see no priest, no flowers, and not even, I think there's a, a cross here, if I'm not mistaken. <coughs> but the other one, which is very interesting, is the fact that all these people who walk around are so used to this misery that they don't even stop to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. This was really important for the day. And now, uh, in 1942, 40, uh, 43, early 43, here we are, a um, few of my classmates. Uh, you can spot me, I'm the handsomest of them all. <laughs> <laughs> That's me there. And um, I show this picture especially because uh, these two people, Angel and this guy here, Sakota, were two of my best friends. This fellow, they were both Jewish. This fellow uh, belonged to a family that left Spain when they came to the Southern Indies, predecessor, they uh, became Turkish citizens. They abandoned Spanish citizenship, where Zapata, his family, maintained the Turkish, I'm sorry, the, the, the Spanish citizenship. So when Greek occupation <coughs> came, uh, Greeks were occupied by the Germans, in 1944, they said to the Spanish former citizens, we'll take you back to Spain. Well, this fellow, of course, was not given an opportunity. They just took him to Europe someplace. And he was disagreed. The Porta, the family said, well, we don't trust him. We're just going to hide in Africa. So they managed to pay a uh, ship captain. They put him in crates, took him to Athens. They hid in the house until the father said, well, I'm going to go out. He went out, somebody spotted him, and the rest is history. They arrested him, sent him to Nelson Bergen, and uh, somehow they were, tra they were being transferred from one place to another near the end of 44. And about uh, 45. And one day, the next day, they were in the forest. The next day they got up, they looked around, they were in Germany. All they saw was American soldiers. So they say they, they were saved, and they, when the war was over, they moved to France. And that's where the family lived. And he is now the only survivor of his family, because they all died for one reason or another. And uh, we are inseparable. We see each other. They come here, and we go there. I must tell you that of the 17 guys in our class, all seven became physicians. Mm -hmm. We applied to medical school in 46. We all got in. I stayed in here, and this is the States, and others. But anyway, it was um, a good school, prepared good students. All of us who apply for medical school graduates. Okay. Ah, here's a picture. Now here I am. You can see I'm holding a, 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 a round piece of bread, you know, a roll, and in front of a donkey. And then if you look back here, there's a basket where my bread is. I fill up a bicycle and uh, <coughs> Pharmacist across from us, you know, put a bandage and gave me also an antitoxin shot, you know, antibodies against tetanus. But I don't know whether it was preparing horses or sheep or where, but it must have been horse because I've been eating a lot of cheese <laughs> and, and no horse meat, so I'm okay, I'm safe. Anyway, uh, this photograph. 
tells a big story. Now, this is a little market street downtown in Thessaloniki. And a German officer suddenly says to me, or points to me, and he says in German, go hold the bread in front of the trunk. Well, of course, I wanted to sell this without the saliva from this little creature. So I held it about a foot away. And um, uh, he thanked us and he left. Now, is, did anybody notice this child? Yes. What do you think is wrong with him? That's right. This is protein inadequacy, protein loss. They don't have enough. And um, the only treatment for this thing is to just replace protein loss with lots of protein. And eventually, they, they manage to survive sometimes. You know, I cannot tell you what happened to this child. <coughs> but I can tell you that six months later, I wasn't selling bread. I was selling raisins on a big small table with a balance and lots of newspapers to sleep and make a little cold. And suddenly, a German officer with, with summer, a short khaki pants, a shatchel, and he put one of his little pistols, not a ruler, on the side. So she starts talking to me in a very quiet, very un, uh, uh, very, I would say, I'm assuming way, like, I'm a friend of yours. And I said, ah, and about a few months back, I joined the underground. And when you do things like that, there's an expression to you, if you've got the fly, you got the skips, you know. So I figured they must know something. And now I'm beginning to think all kinds of things, running away, across the street to the house. But I said, a bullet will hit me before I had any sense, just like the soldier with a bomb. So, but he keeps insisting, and uh, finally he uses the word photograph. Come with me, come with me. I have a photograph. So I said, everything guy is okay. So another kid that was going by, I said, do you mind looking after my raisins? Well, I have to go with this guy. So we go about two feet away, and behind the church I showed you in the early part of the show was a, sto a, a, a studio where a guy was making, he was a sculptor making crosses and other things for tombs in the, in the cemetery. So the Germans took that building and they used it as a drafting. They, looked, they were drafting engineers. So this guy walks in, gets into his office, goes behind the desk, opens the drawer, and gives me the So he recognized me, son of a gun, the all this. Now that's a very poignant story. There were no money. Here's another story. I don't know, but this is a, a little roulette. You know, I just do a schematic thing. A wooden roulette, and these are nails, little nails, numbers written here, and um, there's a piece of cardboard. So as you spin it, it makes a little company you know, two, three, six, fifteen, twenty, and on. So I have a basket with peanuts. So you spell it, if you go to five, you get five peanuts, and you pay, let's say, ten drachmas. Those are the minimums. But, um, so I get into this tavern, and uh, I go to one or two tables and they spin and they get two or three and have uh, to satisfy the, the gambling curiosity. And here there's another guy dressed in a general uniform. And uh, he calls me over, and he makes me over, and he spins it and gets two peanuts. That's no He spins it again, another two peanuts. Still better. Third time, he gets pissed off. He started shouting at me, and I see he's not talking in German. He was using something different. To me, it looked like Slavic, maybe Croatian, because there were many Croats, you know, uh, serving in the, in the German army. So he pulls out his ruler and just sticks it here, 
and starts shouting me like unbelievable. In the meantime though, I'm walking backwards toward the end. I'm holding the little <laughs> roulette and the basket. And he takes the roulette and hits it on the, on the counter of the, of the, of the restaurant. And the bar restaurant and splits it in two. Fortunately, he didn't take my peanuts. So I'm, I'm now walking back and he's still, and everybody now is frozen, thinking, you know, he's gonna shoot me. And he was drunk, there's no question about it. So as we reach the door, he just makes a 100 degree and 80 degree turn, go back to the table, start moving, and I just ran like the dickens. Home. I didn't stop until I got in. And after that, my mother finally said, no more business for you. <laughs> No more enterprise. <coughs> so, anyway, that, that was the closest that I came. Uncle Elias is in the concentration camp where prisoners are executed. Uh, he was a lawyer and um, he was a uh, socialist or whatever, leftist. So the German said to the uh, Greek Bar Association, give us the names of the lawyers who are, you know, this and that. So, and I included on the videos and put him there. For some reason, after two weeks, he was let go. Probably because somehow money stayed in large amounts. In those days, he only stayed in gold. So I have to show you these fake IDs that uh, false IDs, I guess, that Uncle Elias and the Chief of Police um, were working together and making out these uh, ID cards. You see, his last name is Bepolis, and his uh, first name is Superior. Of course, Salvatore was his real name, and uh, his father's name was John, etc. <coughs> this young man here uh, appears sometime in that time, ask uh, Tony Tomasini to the story. In this photograph of gorillas in the mountains, Greek gorillas, and you see that number one, which is right here, and number two, this, one, this is Moises Esserum, and this is Salvatore Bacol, the fellow you saw earlier, joined the gorillas up in the mountains. And what is very interesting is that this guy, number three, uh, uh, he's one of the Greek uh, Christian partisans, Lampis Santos, who in 1941, with Mamonis Gledos, the two of them, climbed up the Acropolis and took the German plague town. Mm -hmm. And they managed to survive all that period and the So this is a fantastic story. Um, and here is more of the uh, Thessaloniki uh, Jews who were sent out. And if you notice that nobody is having any suitcase. The German said, you don't use suitcase. Only bags or blankets wrapped up with uh, rope or whatever. Yes, there's no many cars back here. So uh, we lost about 60, 50,000 uh, of the total Jewish population. Yeah. Many of them managed to escape in the mountains, managed to go to Palestine in those days. And uh, many stayed in uh, many stayed in Greece because they were taken in by Greek families. Uh, sometime in that time, ask uh, Tony Tomasini to the story uh, how his family uh, took in a father and a girlfriend and, and a daughter that were fortunate blue eyed and blonde. And he was also, you know, his father was a Swiss origin. And 
they had to uh, shelter, or not shelter, give uh, a room to a German folks. So the father was sent to the base. Sent to the normal. But the daughter, because of, the, of her looks, it looked very much like uh, Tony's father. That's very good. So they managed to save that girl in that part to the end of the world. Yep. And here are some of the things we did uh, during our resistance writing on the wall. Uh, and here we are. That's me. We're carrying illegal uh, posters and uh, we're taking them to the I say that I was, uh, during that period, also the, or the, the designated speaker of news. The way we did it, we got into these battlements there, and we take the German magazine uh, signal during the war. The Germans made, uh, published a magazine that was uh, made in the shape or style of Black magazine. And using the magazine, I would say, process, you can see, at night. Attention, attention. So we gave them the latest news, where the Russians were, where the Allies were. So finally we have liberation. Um, Uncle John sent us lots of packages of canned goods, chocolate, peanut butter. He explained it. He had to make a literal translation. He said, Pasta is to cute paste. Pasta. But in Greek, any pasta is French pastry. So it's, oh my God, French pastry. French pastry. And we open the damn box and there's jars of peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. <coughs> but we liked it because uh, there was a lot of orange marmalade and combined too. And here I'm in Athens, one of the brown suits. The shoes and uh, the white shirt and the tie are Greek, I would say. And I'm on my way to the Greek em to em American Embassy in Athens for my trip to the States. And I was not the only happy recipient by here as a kid. I got a pretty good shoes. But the second part is now finding a scholar is a crossbow plan. That's going to be the title of my next memoir, which is Extension. So here I was in medical school in Thessaloniki, um, going to medical school at the University of Illinois, pre-medical studies in Chicago and Edison, and graduate studies at the University of Illinois in Urbana, taught by two research heroes. One was Salvatore Lulia, who was uh, a geneticist, a viral geneticist, because she did a lot of work in, in um, synthesis of viral protein, and in 1962 received the Nobel Prize in medicine. Uh, and also uh, Saul Spiegelman, who taught me microbial genetics and then much more. Mm -hmm. Now, the medical school years were full of learning activity, but also a chance to do advanced research as a graduate student, needing a master's degree in biochemistry and the Warden Award in medicine in 1956. I also received my candy, so I walked up the aisle twice, first for the masses uh, and then for the end. In 1966, I began my internship, and in early 1957, I had to choose a military service. I applied to the Air Force and accepted, but my mentors, who also came from Harvard, and they were all infection disease specialists, system, we applied and I. Why? Okay. They wanted me to move to the Lima, Peru, and take over as director of the NIH Bird Research Project. Now, this thing started back in 1952 as a project. But before that, the government said, by the way, said, what happens if we have an atom bomb or a, a nuclear action? There will be a lot of birds, not 10 or 1,000, but hundreds of thousands. So how do we do them? We don't have any burn hospitals in the United States except the Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. Well, 
everything that came in the United States would go to one hospital or another. There were no concentrated centers where you could do really a clinical study. So uh, they said the other important finding was they knew from uh, previous studies and from the war experience that replacement of plasma or blood after injury was life-saving. You could prevent death from shock. So they, that is, the men who were in charge of this, Dr. Rosenthal, uh, did studies in rats and in mice and showed that if you do a crush injury to the muscle, which is untreated, it will kill the, the animal. Or if you burn a mouse in the hot water, <coughs> if you replace, if you treat them with salt solution, you prevent death from shock in about 98% of the case. Mm -hmm. And that was equivalent to using plasma in the, in the animal. So they said, hey, if we had an emergency like this, and we had an accident, we could tell people to step on tablets of salt and then mix it with water and take it, not having to go to the hospital right away. But that was the background information. They went ahead and they said, we're going to do clinical stuff. Well, clinical studies can do it instead. So they said, let's go to the closest place, Central and then South America. And they um, ended up going to Peru. To Peru, because there were only three hospitals where people went. The children's hospital, the old children's, men's hospital, all the men, and the ladies, all the women. That's it. There were three hospitals, all the men in one hospital, whether they were burns or otherwise. All the burns were women in the women's hospital, and all the burns were women. So the project started in 1952. And showed that in adults, salt solution again was as, as efficacious as plasma during that period of time of 72 to 96,000. About two and a half percent of the that's it. So um, the project started, and every child received often the case, I don't know if the case, the same or same as plasma plus a control, whatever, sugar, solution. Anyway, I'll give you. And uh, it was found, and all everyone received antibiotics for that. They found out that within a few months or years, they began to see survival of the shock period, but later they would see deaths from sepsis. The initial course was strep, that was no problem. Staphylococcal resistant strains against the And worst of all, pseudomonas erythrinosa. Any child that developed pseudomonas erythrinosa or adult, septicemia died. It was almost inevitable. So uh, they came back to the United States. Uh, uh, actually to an uh, lab, and they said, maybe we should give them prophylactic gamma globulin. Prophylactic gamma globulin was the only treatment that were given to people with polio. In those days, there was no other medical therapy except the iron lung. So gamma globulin was the only medical uh, therapeutic agent that they were uh, given, and this was supplied by the Red Cross. In 1956, the polio vaccine came out, and the Red Cross was left with tons of gamma globulin. So they said to an audience, you want some gamma globulin? To give you all you want. So that was my job to try to test the efficacy of full human gallon 
with saving or with plasma, plus saving, or young government, of the moon, et cetera, different companies. And that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. That's me, that's Sam, a car. This was the same, uh, this was the same government managed to send uh, for us because we, said, hey, we got a good time. We were something between an, an, an embassy personnel and army personnel. So they gave us red or pink, not pink, but red uh, passports. They called special passports. <coughs> so they shifted. Here's Jane, Rose Bay. Um, she was very, very adamant about going to Peru. She said, what am I going to do in the jungle? I said, no, not jungle. I said, jungle is a few miles up. But <laughs> finally she was convinced by my professors uh, to go because it would have been good for my career. Mm -hmm. I had no idea about clinical studies. I was just finishing internship, and I, I didn't know this. A word of Spanish, of course, I, I quickly got a, a record and I started studying. And um, um, but my one of my mentors, Dr. Leper, went there and convinced us to go. And so finally, we got into this first class um, Panagra plane, and uh, we got off the panel. We got off, just stop over. What did you bring me? It was so hot. I said, no, it's not the jungle. I said, not yet. And then we go on. We got off at um, Quito, Ecuador. And it was morning. You see the tumbling stuff. There was nothing in there. <gasps> Starts crying. He says, look who you brought me. So finally we went up to Lima. I think we need to change. And, uh, and here we are again with Sam in, the, uh, in one of the most uh, uh, luxurious suburbs, San Isidro, and, uh, and we had an apartment there. Jane uh, uh, adopted, adopted very rapidly, started to learn Spanish, later <coughs> uh, boy, she went boy. In fact, they gave her a whole silver dish as the person with the most promise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the children's hospital, the place where uh, we had the various opinions, as we call them. This is a very important thing because I started having Christmas trees. You know, they never had Christmas trees. What do you do? do, you do? Oh, I said, this is an Americanism. You, you gringos have it. I said, no, no, no. Uh, I found the president of ITT, the International Telegraph, the Telegraph, in uh, Joe. It was New York Symphony Orchestra with Bernstein Festival Group. And of course, people like us went. And I went to see, I said, by the way, would you like to have some, some kids to help you? Buy us a tree. So they did. We decorated it and we said it like this. The, mm -hmm. the nurses were the there, not the nurses were there. The nuns who run the hospital, Carmelite, said, oh, this is another gringo trip. I said, no. No, it's for the kids. So anyway. The point is that we eventually took the tree and we put it in the pavilion where the burn kids were. But we became very, very good friends and they became very supportive of our country. And one week after we got to Lima, we were told that it was the, in, the American Pediatric Congress. And the president of the hospital, I said, you should go too. So we were invited. And here's a picture from uh, this. This is where the doctors, the wives of doctors. Um, and here's the president of the children's hospital with his wife dancing the famous Peruvian war, uh, dance, La Marinera. Few were anybody or even to do anything. If you knew how to do the Marinera, you were a hero. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, here we are on the roof of the hospital. <coughs> Again. Here's me, and here's Dr. Bazan, who was the surgeon, plastic surgeon. This fellow was a pediatrician. Um, and this two people worked in our project. He was just a physician. Um, 
Well, here we have at the Christmas party, you can see, uh, we have Christmas cards. Here's Dr. Arana, who is a microbiologist, well-trained, first class. Here's uh, Pedro Stafni, who is uh, with the, I would say the biochemist, but he was an MD also, and he uh, left in 1960 uh, and went to Texas, uh, University of Texas, he became a professor of rheumatology, and today he's still practicing. This lady here became the wife, the nurse, became the wife of the doctor who the surgeon that I showed you. Um, here's another shot to show you again. This is the famous director of the hospital, Moray, his name. That's me, and he's the guy to whom we sold our car before we left. <laughs> but this one was the picture of the most beautiful uh, doctor in, as far as I know, I know the hospital. <laughs> but uh, very, very unapproachable. And now you can see some of the miserable uh, burns. What is very typical of these things? Number one, the mothers parents brought their kids and they just dumped them there because they said you, you take care of them no question sir. second thing is unlike today we never asked them do you want your kid to be given to be part of the study or do you want no, no consent form this is 1956 57 58 59 60, nothing don't forget, in the States, we didn't start until 74, 75. So, that's it. The, the thing which killed most of these kids was pseudomonas septicemia. And anybody who has seen sepsis or septicemia will know that this is a thymogranosis. The bug gets into the capillary, multiplies like crazy, and stops the blood, blood uh, flow everywhere especially in the lungs and other ones. Here's a guy who's doing well. He managed to escape. And we did all kinds of cultures to prove that even in the early phases of shock, during the first day or two, any deaths were actually associated with positive blood culture. So death from shock also could be associated in addition with a bacterial uh, infection. Here I just showed you Dr. Vasan doing his skin uh, graft. He just uses a dermatome, you know, mm -hmm. and here's the, and the skin is, is pulling it up. Very good doctor. And we're still, you know, communicating with each other. He's a happy guy. There's another group of 10 little kids that survived. And I want to show you the typical uh, dress of a Peruvian mother, uh, which dons this hat, which is every woman, mm -hmm. uh, every woman <coughs> is carrying a wearing a hat. Some cops, some of the ladies there. Yeah. And uh, the famous yeah, llamas, as you call them, the llamas, which were very prevalent. And here's another, another woman uh, with another cute looking hat. And here's another happy face. Now, I can tell you these things because uh, one other characteristic, what characterized our association with the Peruvian doctor was the French. They were open, unconditional French. And uh, this thing lasted after we left. And they would call me on my birthday. They loved birthday. And my first, first, first birthday in Peru was January 17, 1958. They surprised me, not my wife. They always had to get in with the wife to pay the food, the drinks, and everything. So there we come home, we went to a movie. In those days, movies started at 10 o'clock. So we came home. 12, and I suddenly I 
hear shuffling in the stairway. And then I start to look around. I said, what's going on? I said, let me see. Oh, by the time she went to the door, the music began playing. And they all came in and started wish me for the birthday. And we had to crack the scotch. And this lasted all the years we were there. And we had no surprises anymore. But we had big parties and restaurants. Invited everybody.